good evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome here. I'm glad that you made it here in spite of the traffic and that you were not diverted by other potential entertainment down the road <laughs> there, but that you're here. Welcome here. It's so good to see you all here. My name is Derek Kloss, and I'm the chair of the board of the Existential Analysis Society of Canada. And we're the organization that is hosting this evening here. Uh, we're very grateful to St. Paul's Hospital to be having us here, um, and we're, we're very pleased to be able to be offering such an event here. We do this regularly, um, but every time I hear that there's new people are here. So if I could just get a show of hands, for whom is this the first time here tonight? See, look at that. Well, welcome here. I, I, my hunch then is that partly the attraction of tonight is the topic on narcissism. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this is relevant to you personally <laughs> as, as well. Um, and you're here to understand perhaps somebody that you know a bit better. But it's, it's a great pleasure to have you here and to welcome you here tonight. Before I introduce our speaker for the, for the evening, I want to say just a few words uh, just in terms of our society and in terms of a potential involvement if you are interested in existential analysis. Tonight you get a little bit of an appetizer for what existential analysis is about uh, by really are the main, one of the main people in our organization who's been doing a lot of work in this since, well, since a long time here. That reminds me, please turn off your cell phones. Um, <laughs> and so we, we in Canada, however, have been doing our training here since 2006. And the way the training happens is that it happens in cohorts. And it takes a bit longer. This is a bit of a European style training. And so it takes a bit. You can think of this as a, a good fine wine that takes while, a while to develop here. Um, and so we offer evenings like this that are free. We also offer introductory seminars to that. And especially if you're interested in pursuing something like that, we, we have had one just recently. We have one probably in the next month or two or so which is a three-day introductory seminar there. Um, and if you are interested in doing something like that and participating in a weekend, I'm just going to point out my colleague, Mihaela Lalanu. Mihaela, would you just stand, please? Speak to this lovely woman. <laughs> speak to this, yes, and we had one more other colleague here, but speak to this lovely woman or to myself afterwards if you are interested in participating in this training there. Uh, our hope is to start a cohort, a training cohort, in the fall, in September of 2017. So that's our goal, and we're well on our way there. Um, but if this is something that you feel drawn to, and you feel like, I would like to participate in this, yeah, please come and talk to uh, either myself or to my colleague here as well. For those of you who are not quite yet convinced that you want to do this, and maybe you need to read a bit more in advance of that, I want to just point out one of the books that is available here. It's called Living Your Own Life, Existential Analysis in Action. It's an edited book by Dr. Lengla's wife, Sylvia Lengla, and uh, uh, Australian psychiatrist named Christoph, Christoph, uh, Christopher Worm. And this one is available here. We have about 50 copies down there. It's available for $35 in the old-fashioned way, i.e. cash, please. Um, so, and you can either approach myself or approach, well, probably approach myself after work. Dr. Langley will be probably busy speaking with some people. But please come and talk to me if you're interested in buying one of these books here. If you are simply interested in more information, I'm going to be passing around a sign-up sheet for an email list. We don't inundate your email with email with your 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 address with emails. We send out three seminar uh, three uh, newsletters a year with a few announcements here or there. So if you haven't signed up for it yet, um, so if you have, don't sign up again. It's perfectly okay. If you haven't signed up, please feel free to do so, and I'll just pass this around at this point. Before we get going, just a, a brief announcement around washrooms. Should you need these, sometimes our seminars go a bit long and you need a washroom out the back door is a possibility or around here. It's towards the back of that, both men and women's washrooms there. Okay, so have, have I forgotten anything? Around announcements? 
There's also some information sheets here about our society and about the upcoming training. Those are free of charge. Please help yourself to those. Okay, very good. Well, it's a pleasure now to introduce Dr. Alfred Lengle here to you. Um, for those of you who don't know him, Dr. Lengle is a, a physician, first of all, by trade, trained as a physician in general, general medicine then, and practice in a psychiatric unit, then also trained as a psychologist there and works really as a psychotherapist in Vienna full time. He has uh, worked together very, for a good decade with Dr. Viktor Frankl. So if you know that name, Dr. Frankl and Dr. Lengda were closely together, then co-founded the society of which he is the international president there. The, the, he's the president of the International Society for Logotherapy and Existential Analysis there. Um, he has published very, very widely. I'd encourage you to go to his website if you want to get a sense as to how many things he has published, books, articles. There's also lots of videos that are available here. And so we will be uh, creating a video and uploading it to his website and to YouTube of even this evening of this lecture tonight. So it makes it widely available. He comes regularly here. He's been here since 2001. I think maybe one year he has not traveled to Vancouver, but he's been here regularly there. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome him. He has a wonderful, has developed a, a wonderful approach, especially for dealing with personality disorders here. And this is what we're going to be talking about more broadly here tonight. So I wonder if you would kindly welcome with me Dr. Alfred Lengle here tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much, Derek, for your presentation and uh, introduction of the evening. I'm very grateful to the Society of EA Canada to make it possible this evening and to have the opportunity to speak about narcissism. And if I put myself into the narcissistic mode, I would say I'm, I feel hurt by your invitation, by your introduction, because you mentioned that the most important attractive attraction point is the theme and not me. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> we are speaking about a phenomenon which is uh, quite uh, known especially in leading positions in the society. Uh, people who are very much um, involved in, their, in the theme of self-esteem. And they are occupied with them. And about 1% of the population, or a bit less than 1%, than show the full fully fledged picture of narcissistic disorder. But many more people have some traits of narcissism and every one of us has to do with the same theme as narcissists have to deal with. And so I want to try to m show you the whole range from the normal development until the psychopathology and the suffering of, psych of narcissistic disorder. The term narcissism uh, comes from the Greek mythology. Narcissus was the son of the river god Cephisus and the nymph Lyriope, whom and Cephisus seduced and then violated the, uh, the nymph. This is also something uh, which has, which leads us directly into the realm of narcissism. There is seduction and there is some violence. And in Narcissus' uh, parents were worried about uh, the beauty, the extraordinary beauty of the child this is also something we will see that even in modern psychotherapy, it is described that this is one of the causes which lead to, to narcissism, 
there is something extraordinary, some elements which are striking me, which are special, the extraordinary beauty of this child. And they were worried and asked the uh, prophet Theresias about the future of this child. And Theresias told them that the boy would grow old only if he didn't get to know himself. So, not knowing himself provides him a long life, but knowing himself doesn't, he doesn't help him to survive. He will die early as soon as he starts to know himself. When he comes closer to himself, this is a deadly experience. But being distant to oneself allows him a long life. Very interesting, this method. When Narcissus was 16, he was walking in the woods and Nymph Echo saw him and fell madly in love with him, something which happened with several other people, but Echo was very madly in love with him. And she started following him and Narcissus asked, who is there? Because he heard that something is, somebody is following him and asked, who is there? And Echo responded, who is there? It is the Echo. He speaks and gets back the Echo of himself. How terrible. He has no access to the otherness. And uh, that went on for some time until Echo decided to show herself. And she tried to embrace the boy who stepped away from Echo, telling her to leave him alone. This is typical narcissism. The closeness is unbearable for that. Echo was left heartbroken and spent the rest of her life in glens until nothing but an echo sound remained of her. In the Greek version, this is the Roman version of, of, written by Ovi, in the Greek version, written down by Conon, it was not a woman, it was, of course, a man, a young man who fell in love with Narcissus. Arminius was his name. And, but the same happened to him. Narcissus rejected him <coughs> and sent him a sword with which he may committed suicide, but only after uh, asking the gods for vengeance. Nemesis, the goddess of revenge, heard the story and decided to punish Narcissus. Narcissus, and the punishment was that Narcissus, with his extraordinary beauty, looked into a pond and has seen his image. And what happened to him? The same as happened to everybody who has seen him. He fell madly in love with his image. And uh, he was attracted by this beauty. And he was, became sick of this beauty. And he tried to, to come closer to this image, to this beautiful image. And then suddenly, or by the time he figured out that his love could not be reciprocated and then he killed himself. Not reciprocated love. The flower that bears his name sprang up where he died and out of the blood which fell into the earth. So this is the myth behind, or the myth which gave the name to this disorder, and this myth describes in a very antique way, a lot of psychology, which we are going to explain now more in detail. I already said that the um, narcissistic disorder, the narcissistic pain, the narcissistic structure is very much in, um, occupied with, uh, the, or with, has an over-concern even, with issues of self-esteem. 
the narcissist has a special feeling. He feels um, exact. He has exaggerated feelings of self-importance. This is a central term. I am important. I am. Uh, I am a significant person. And this self-importance is something which he just feels and he is convinced and he is pervaded by this feeling. It is not something which he deduces from some activities or successes or, or uh, achievements. No, he feels simply that he is extraordinarily important. He, he has no other feeling for himself than to be important. The, if you ask him, why do you feel so important? He said, it is so. It is natural. That's the truth. That's the reality. How can't you see that? So this is like a distortion of the, the real self-image. It is a constructed self-image out of a psychodynamic, which we have to see more in detail later, uh, which gives him the, the constant impression of being extraordinary, grandiose, superb, full of splendor. He, he hates what is normal. What is, he hates the ordinary. Only the extravagant, the special, is good enough for him. And he has the constant feeling that I am somebody, somebody of importance. This, uh, this makes him, of course, hardly accessible. It is a feeling which has the same characteristic as the feeling of a paranoid person. This is like a paranoia of self-esteem. And you know, in paranoia, you cannot discuss with paranoid persons. They are so totally convinced about their opinions and their visions of the situations and the world and what people do with him uh, or her. So it is the same with the narcissist. You cannot discuss his self-esteem, his feeling of self-importance. And out of this feeling of self-importance is derived a, a sense of entitlement. Of course, when I am a very a VIP person, then I am entitled. I, entitlement means that I don't have to stand in line as everybody, as normal, ordinary people, because a president doesn't have to stand in line. Of course, he is invited to go ahead of everybody. And, <clears throat> and uh, he, he shows these uh, narcissistic persons show a grandiosity in their beliefs and behavior. Nothing is normal. Everything is superb. It's just the, the, the best. It is the extravagant. And then, of course, when you feel that way, it is just natural that other people see it. <laughs> and who doesn't see it, those who don't see it, they are just stupid. <laughs> they, are, they do not match the, the quality, the hate, uh, you know. He is convinced, or she is convinced, of, about their extraordinary uh, beauty, power, success, uh, um, just uh, grand, grandiose, grandiosity of being. And so they have a strong need of admiration. Which is just the, the, the logic consequence. They, um, they even search for compliments. And uh, they have the feeling to have a right for admiration. And um, they in to be involved or entangled in such kind of constant feelings and needs and desires 
they are, of course, occupied with themselves, like Narcissus was occupied with the beauty of the picture of himself. He cannot, could not stop looking at himself anymore. And he wanted to embrace it. And by embracing this picture, he destroyed this, the surface of the water and the, destroyed the picture. And he realized this picture of himself is not, has no reality. It is just a reflection, but it's, it, it is lacking the truth. So in this bulb of feelings and, and attraction by himself, herself, they um, lack, have a total lack of empathy. They do not see other people. They cannot in, feel into other people. So we have in the center, we have this feeling, constant feeling of self-importance. As a consequence of self-importance is the uh, sense of entitlement, the feeling of the sh uh, the showing himself, herself in a grandiosity, in belief, in behavior. And to attract admiration with no real contact to the feelings of others. Echo had to die. The Ammonius had to die. They, they are not reached by the, by the narcissist. Narcissist. And along with this come uh, two sorts of basic impairments. In existential analysis, we describe the human being, the ego, as taking part in of two worlds, the outer world and the inner world. And the ego is the overlapping structure of the two worlds. We are at the same time connected with the outer world and with the inner world. When I'm speaking now, I'm uh, addressing you, I'm concentrating on you, but at the same time, I'm always listening a bit into myself. And I get the feeling and then an inner echo of what I'm doing. I have a resonance. So I have, I'm connected with the inner world, and out of this, I'm changing my voice, I'm speaking faster or slower, etc., because I'm somehow talking to me while I'm talking to you. So we are always in two worlds. And both worlds are consequently disturbed, impaired. With this central obsessive feeling of um, import self-importance, I am not really relating to the outer world and not really relating to the inner world. So as a consequence, and this is interesting that in DSM-5, this double impairment, exactly this double impairment, was stressed for the first time. And so in the inner, the, the inner world, the, personal, the, the personality functioning is impaired. The self-functioning, the identity, there is no real identity. There is an, um, an exaggerated relation to other people, to the outer world. They do not rela cannot relate to themselves. They do not know and feel what, who they are. They take the picture of themselves from the, uh, from the outer world, how others admire him or her. And they, ha and they have no constant self-direction, no orientation. They cannot set goals and, and follow them constantly. Uh, they uh, need the approval of others. And they set exaggerated standards for themselves. But also in the interpersonal, in the outer world, in the interpersonal functioning, you have a, a similar impairment. Not knowing who I am and not having clear directions for myself, always depending from others, they look to the outer world 
but interpersonal fun the interpersonal functioning is impaired because they cannot uh, feel with the other. They have no empathy. They cannot perceive the needs of others and the, their feelings. They react to others only when it is important for themselves. They abuse the others for their own profit. And there is no intimacy, no personal connection in the relationships. The relationships are superficial. They serve the self-esteem, the self-value. There is no real interest for the other. They, the relationship with others is dominated by the need to, to, for personal gain. So with this central quasi-paranoic feeling of the self-importance, a whole bunch of consequences are related which make the life difficult for themselves and also for the people who live with them. <coughs> they, as such, I give you some more symptoms, uh, personality traits of this uh, disorder. They, uh, they live in fantasies of, uh, of immense success, of immense power, brilliance, beauty. Whatever they do, they are convinced nobody can do it in a similar way. They are outstanding in whatever they do, even if seen from the outside. It's not even, it may not even be good or adequate, but their subjective feeling for the, what they do is that it is extremely good. And if somebody starts to criticize it, they say, this is, this is a mediocre, ordinary person who doesn't see and can't see and understand the quality of what I do, because it is so rare, so outstanding, that normal people are not able to catch it. This is, but you cannot discuss it with them, because they are so convinced. And this makes it difficult to, to live with such people and to, to work with them. And their uh, being special is so that they, it's very logic for them. They feel their grandiosity. And they say, well, the, the small cannot encompass, grasp the big. So small people cannot catch and grasp the grandiosity of, of what, what I represent. They in the relationship, uh, they are uh, trying to uh, take advantage of the relationships. They, uh, narcissists are always abusive. They enter a relationship, but never for the other, always for themselves, because they need the other. Without the other, they are nothing. And they often uh, are envious of other people and, uh, or believe or think that others are envious to them. They like others being envious for them because this shows them that they are something special, that they, are, they have the better deal. And they are envious to others when they feel that somebody gets something what he feels to be entitled to have this success, this applause, this, this uh, money, this career, etc. And they cannot stand if somebody else gets that what they do not have. They cannot, they compete any, everybody, they become rival uh, when, when they see that somebody comes up into their head. They must be on the top. 
So um, to sum it up, the self-importance, the central theme, is mainly nurtured by three elements. They use objects. And even other people are objects for them. The second, they see themselves as special, outstanding. And the third, they use evaluations to support their outstanding self-esteem or self-value. We can ask ourselves on this uh, point, um, what does it mean to me to be important? Am I important? For the narcissist, it is very central to be important and to experience this importance constantly. And it, but what do we, as human beings who are not narcissistic, what do we experience when we are, yeah, do we, do we want to be important? Are we sometimes important? And to whom and why? Of course, in a loving relationship, we, we want to be important for the beloved person. In a parental relationship, we are important for the children. There are many situations in our professional life. It's also important to have the position and to experience some importance. So it is something we all need and we all experience. It's not a question of being narcissistic. It's a question of being human, being living a, a personal life. What, um, what do I feel when I am important? We need it to experience that I am somebody. It is somehow structuring our ego, our self-image. Uh, it gives me a place. It gives me a weight, a value. It gives me a natural authority to have some importance. But, and also when I feel an imp to be important for somebody, this gives me some access to the other person. But importance is tricky because importance is more the aspect of a role and it is not so much relational. It is, it is not relationship. It is a, a special kind of connection. Importance has more to do with the dimension of being oneself, of finding the ego and has less to do with the emotional connection with other people. So we see that the central theme of the, of the narcissist produces a kind of connection which is not relational in itself. And we all know it. And we all have this part in our, in our lives also, but normally, this being of importance to children, to partner, to friends, etc. Um, this kind, this part of, of connection is underpinned, underlined by an emotional relationship to which the narcissist is not able, he, he has not this access and tries to compensate this lack of emotionality, of empathy, of sympathy of feeling for the other and feeling for himself or herself <clears throat> tries to compensate this with being more important but cannot reach this combined package of social relationship. So uh, what let us come to a 
understanding uh, more an understanding more through a, an existential perspective of the uh, existential dynamic here, yeah, the anthropological background. There is an in the central of uh, narcissism is a compensation of a great lack. What is lacking? The ego is lacking. Also, he has such a gra grandiose ego, apparently. In reality, he, the ego is not really functioning. The ego is lost. There is a deficit. He doesn't know himself. He cannot see himself. He cannot feel himself. And he cannot judge or evaluate or assess or esteem himself. The ego structures which make give us the possibility to, to grasp our inner self, our core, these ego structures are not developed sufficiently or are blocked. There are three elements which form the ego structure. The ego structure are growing, and this is the, the normal development in the human being. They are growing by getting attention, by getting justice from others, and by getting uh, appreciation from others. And by we need the other people, and here is the, we already see the primary cause of the development of uh, narcissism. When these three elements do not take place, the person cannot develop the ego. So the, to, when we get attention, then we start to see ourselves. When we get justice, then we get a feeling of the value of ourselves and, and of the importance. And when we, are, when we get estimation, appreciation, then we develop a self-value out of ourselves. We can develop the capacity to, for, for finding self-value by what we receive from other people. This is something great, which happens over the many years of development, from the early childhood on, until the end, let's say, the end of puberty. Puberty is still an important period for, for developing the ego. And this is, a, there is a deficit or a blockage in the narcissistic personalities. And therefore, they cannot develop an inner presence. They are not really there for themselves. So, they cannot develop according to these three dimensions, the three functions, uh, um, attention, justice, and appreciation. They cannot develop a real picture of themselves. They do not see themselves. They cannot come to a distance to themselves. They cannot look at themselves. They are blind for themselves. He doesn't know who he is. They cannot develop an identity with themselves. And therefore, but they have the need to develop an identity. It, it is the time to, the, for the growing ego to develop identities, but they cannot see themselves. And so they see objects. And therefore, they <coughs> identify with objects as a replacement for this lack of access to the inner self. They do not get the right attention, and therefore they cannot see themselves and, the, and take objects which replace their inner self. Objects like uh, work, uh, things to possess, uh, uh, partners, uh, profession, everything can serve as an object 
if it has some social value, then it is right, a right object for the replacement. So they can help themselves. This is a solution. This is a narcissistic solution of this painful deficit. They do not get enough justice. Uh, they are not taken seriously. So they develop a, a, a lack of relation to their own feelings. He cannot do justice to himself or herself. They are not authentic because they do not really know what is their own. So they cannot do justice and see their own, but they have a need to see their own. And what do they take? They take the second central element of which is uh, the source of this feeling of importance. The second element is this feeling of being special compared with others. He is blind for himself. He doesn't see himself. He needs other people to get a slight idea of who is himself. And when he is special, to be special means I am seen, but I am different. And my difference must be of value, because I want to do justice to myself. I am somebody. I want to be somebody. And therefore, this being special must be special in superiority, not in inferiority. This is, would be the depressive solution. But the narcissistic solution is, the nar as the narcissist appears when he comes into the door, to the door, he has the head upright, and he, he has the nose in the heaven, and he, he looks uh, uh, self-convinced, and everybody sees here, here there is somebody who appears. He, a narcissist never comes this way into the practice room. <laughs> <coughs> so the second structure, the e second ego structure not functioning leads to a to a lack of authenticity, of connecting with the real own and to the replacement by uh, comparing with others and looking what is special. And the third ego structure, which is not working, coming out from the appreciation of others, leads to the experience that he cannot judge himself because he he cannot, when, when we are appreciated by others, we, we get also a critical view and people tell us what they like and what they maybe even admire and, and what they find uh, uh, really touching them. This is the appreciation. I like that and it moves me when I see you playing with the children or whatever. Then when we get such personal feedback, then I get not only a picture of myself, I get an evaluation. If this is a judgment of my behavior and of my behavior behind which it's me. So they cannot, do not learn to judge themselves, to, to, take, to come to a position towards themselves. They cannot develop self-value out of themselves of course, we first need the others who give us the appreciation. But then we do it by ourselves. But this is not working in the narcissist. So he constantly needs the others to give them appreciation, but much more than appreciation, admiration, the best of the best of best of appreciation. And to enhance that, to, uh, uh, to strengthen that experience, they start to devaluate. And they become arrogant. Arrogancy is typical narcissistic. This means uh, this is condescent. This is my superiority. This is 
well, I don't have to talk with you. You are not, you are not, you are not good enough for me. This is arrogance. Super, a feeling of superiority which does not allow a dialogue, an exchange. And so they build a wall, a protection wall around themselves with respectable objects, with things. Uh, they, their self-value is totally exteriorized. They have no access to the inner self. They, the ego is not functioning. The ego is uh, like a way to, to um, take out from the inner side. It is the instrument to take out from the inner side the value which is represented by me as a person. We all have an inner value. This is blocked. This is not working. The ego is paralyzed, partly paralyzed, but it is working well towards the outer side. And so they create objects, special specialities, and devaluation of others to create a substitution of this lack of inner value of self-value. This is the narcissistic solution of their problem. They make the solution through identifications with objects, with devaluation, and with uh, specialities which they ascribe to themselves. This uh, inner self is also a protection for them. It's not only a substitution, it is a protection because the center of the ego, there where the ego is not functioning, is very vulnerable. It is in the stage of a two or three year old child. <coughs> and they have to protect. They, they protect with all their energy that nobody comes into this intimate inner center, not even themselves. They don't look at it, but they have a feeling that nobody should really know who is, what is me, what, what I feel, what is uh, in, in my center. And so they take the, the, the wall of uh, respectable objects that everybody who comes close remains in that wall and cannot pass through. They see the object, they see the success, they make them occupy with the, with the representations of the ego for not being touched personally, intimately. For the narcissist, it is painful to, to come close to an intimate being touched. We can ask ourselves in this situation very or in this moment when we speak about the self value what can i appreciate for myself in myself what do i feel to be good what do i like who am i really and can I appreciate myself? These are, this is a central question of the narcissistic personality. He or she, they have a resolution of this problem by this exteriorization and identification. But the non-narcissistic resolution of this question, which is a, a human question of every human being. Who am I really and can I appreciate myself? Do I feel a value? Then we say, well, there are two sides. There is an inner side and there is an outer side. The inner side, I say, well, I can value just my being that I am and uh, my character, my attitudes, my uh, 
my love, my fidelity, my belief, all this, my inner world. This is so valuable for me and for that I appreciate myself in the, for the way I am living that. This inner vision, picture of himself, herself, is not accessible for the narcissistic. But we also have the outer side. We can appreciate ourselves for the, um, for the successes we have, for the clothing, for the, the car, for the villa or the house, or more superficial things, but they also count. I, I feel very different uh, according to when I wear new beautiful clothes and go out or go for a ceremony. I have a different feeling than when I just come in blue jeans or so. This is, the, the clothes make the personality somehow. Not totally, but a little bit we know of this. Of this. The narcissist knows only this. He has no access to the inner, to the inner world. So um, the narcissist develops this great wall, protective wall of objects and specialities and devaluation around him or themselves. And this becomes this wall becomes hypertrophic. This wall is called the self. The self is bigger than the ego. The self replaces the ego. The ego is in the midst of the self. This is this inner dialogue, this inner contact, this inner connection with my feelings, with my, how I appear to myself. This is very weak, very uh, childish, infantile, uh, not successful. This is not really working well. Instead, the outer world, the outer, the self is big, grandiose. And the, the question is now for the, the narcissist, how can he preserve this construct, because this is, of course, a fragile solution. And he has to work for, to maintain this solution. And he works to maintain it, to look for a warranty of his self-esteem, of his value, of the way how he appears to other people and how he see, sees himself reflected by the admiration of other people. What is the warranty for such a wall of objects? There is a warranty when you are the best. It's obvious. When I'm the best, nobody can critique me. I'm superior to everybody. I'm not graspable. I cannot be reached. And being the best means, of course, to be a rival to everyone who wants to come up and to match with me. He, he must destroy the other person because if another person pretends to be better than me or at least as good as I am, this destroys my warranty. This brings me into danger. This is a terrible fight for, of protection of this small, replacement of ego, which they do. <clears throat> and there is a warranty of self-value because the objects make the self-value graspable. Then I see who I am. With the Porsche, it's clear that I am of value. And it's visible and everybody sees it and there is no doubt. So the objects have, um, a, have also a very important, play a very important role, this exteriorization, 
because behind the object they can hide themselves and are not graspable, not uh, uh, attackable. But the use of the object makes them constantly abusive because abusive is not so, so much a danger with objects. <coughs> we can use a car as abusively uh, for the self-esteem, okay. But if we use children or partners for this ob as objects for the self-esteem, then this is devaluating, hurting, offending the other people. And then this makes the, the narcissistic quite uh, destructive in relationships. He fights with all his energy for this warranty, and this makes him respectless. This makes him egoistic. Because he has to fight for this warranty, he cannot allow himself to be empathic. He, he cannot do it anyway, but if he would be able to be empathic, he could, he, if, he do, he, if he does that, this weakens himself or herself. He, he must fight. And this is uh, not just a fight of being a little bit better than other people or so. It is not a fight for luxury. It's a fight for survival. And this is typical for personality disorders. These fights are vital fights because if he can, doesn't, if he loses the warranty, then he is in danger to be destroyed, that the ego is dissolving. This replacement of ego which he developed, which is the narcissistic solution of this central lack of not having ego structures who can take advantage from the inner life. All is turned towards the outside. And if he loses that, he has no ego. And how is a life without being me, without having a feeling that it's me who lives it? This is something very painful. And so the, the, the wall of objects and the fight for them, for the warranty, is really full of vitality and it is a vital danger if this is not guaranteed. And there are, of course, anxieties. There are anxieties um, because the inner pole is lacking in their self, in their experience of themselves. They have the anxiety that they can lose the feeling for themselves. They can lose the ego. They, that if somebody is not giving the admiration, the danger is already there. They are constantly in danger because they feel the frailty of this construction and they feel this inner emptiness and void. They can fall into this abyss. And if the little if there is a little bit of critique or not getting the admiration, not getting that feed of admiration, then they are alert. And the second fear is that they fear that they lose the admiration, and when they lose the admiration from the others, they also cannot admire themselves. So the fear, ultimately, is the fear to get lost when he, is, he or she is not embedded in a condition, unconditioning um, admiration. When they get admiration, they live in the heaven. This is a, such a relief for them. Because they are not in danger. They can live a little bit of ego life and have a bit of feeling of who they are. They are in a, uh, 
en eh, paradisiac el Elysian unity with themselves. It's a heavenly feeling. They are addicted to this relational relation to, to themselves. When they get admiration, appraisal, then life is totally good. And they are addicted to this feeling of heaven. They experience almost a symbiotic dissolution with themselves. They are, then they have a, 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 a kind of feeling of being close to themselves. Something what we normally can experience, we feel sometimes more, sometimes less, but normally every day we have situations, at least when we go to sleep, where we come closer to ourselves and get connected with our feelings and, and we resonate with ourselves and feel that it's me, I'm there and I'm fine or I'm, I'm sad or whatever is, but I'm in relation with my, but he or they do not have this experience except when they get the admiration and when they are praised and, um, and get what they need. They live in this uh, bulb, and, but they have to fight for it. And they live in a way, an exclusivity for themselves, with themselves. They don't let anybody come close to them. They live exclusively themselves when they get the, the, the feed from the outside. The anxiety is, of course, to lose this heavenly feeling, to be dethronized, to fall from the throne, and to fall out of the heaven. This is a, a feeling as if uh, one loses a, the relation to a goddess or to a god. And so, he lives in a constant seduction of himself, herself, in this inner symbiotic unity with the picture of himself or herself. Because they have this imagination, they have the picture in the outside. And when they come close, the same thing happens as Narcissus experienced when he tried to kiss his picture. It disappears. So they must keep in distance these objects somehow. And this distance is, um, is passed over by the admiration. The admiration reaches him and produces this heavenly feeling of unity with themselves. Unity with their picture. The what let us see now the in another uh, um, some more detailed elements of the inner world, the phenomenology of how the narcissist experiences his life and what he is doing and why he is doing. So we gave now first the diagnostic picture with this central uh, term of self-importance, this entitlement and all the consequences. Then we described the, uh, the psychological or also existential lack in the narcissistic picture, this ego which is not functioning because there are there is a lack in the, de in the uh, development of the three structures of the ego, which leads to these replacements and to, to this big wall of objects and superiorities and devaluation. Because the inner world is blind, 
they don't see themselves, they don't feel themselves, they, they cannot judge themselves. Combined with constant anxiety, there is always underneath anxiety, and therefore they are tense. They look so superior. They appear so. But they have a hard life because they have to, to guarantee their, their picture. Now let us see how they function from the inside. Uh, what do they do to survive, to keep themselves alive? What are the characteristic behavior? First of all, they are constantly occupied with a creating a respectable self-image. They work on them. They want to, to appear well, to be the best, to uh, look nicely, to produce the right image. Yeah. Sorry, this isn't for us. <laughs> <laughs> we are not so important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thinking always circulates around how do I appear? What do other people think of me? Um, uh, do I appear cool? Do I appear superior? Um, I don't want that they think badly about me and they start to be manipulative. This is always present. A dominating attention. They want to make themselves inassailable. This is so present that they even abuse themselves, like in the following joke, um, the, this a British joke. Uh, in Great Britain, there was an East Indian living in the neighborhood of, an, of a British family. And the East Indian wanted to be as good as the, East, uh, as the, as the British people. And the in the English family um, enlarged the car, bought a bigger car. The East Indian did the same. The English people made a journey around the world. The East Indian did the same. The English uh, people finally uh, built a big swimming pool in the garden. The East Indian didn't have that much money, so he couldn't compete with that. But he made a narcissistic solution. He said, well, in contrast to the English people, I have an English neighbor, but he has only an East Indian neighbor. <laughs> so narcissists make use of uh, in their need for he always being the best they abuse e can even abuse themselves or their psychopathology when they are sick when they have a, a psychic disorder this disorder is not does not devaluate them but it is a special disorder a disorder which nobody has and which only the best specialists have to deal with but even they are not able and they change the best specialist with the other best specialist because they are all not capable to resolve their problem because it is so special. And so they also abuse themselves constantly. It, it is their thinking is circulating only about to appear in the best way. The uh, this O constant occupation with the self-image is one way of their, or, or one central element in their inner lives. A second element is they create distance because they want to be untouchable and unreachable. I already, we already spoke about this wall of objects which, in which 
he is hiding the ego, his weak ego. So they hide themselves be behind the object. And when somebody comes close, he is disturbed. If somebody comes and looks into his or her eyes and says, I love you so much, and looks as you do in a loving relationship, he, he is uh, irritated, or they are irritated. They do not understand. They, they cannot believe what is going on then. They, they ask themselves, what does he or she want from me? And he gets paranoid thoughts and feelings. And it's even worse. He cannot imagine what the other wants from him because he has no symmetric, similar inner counterpart to what is brought to them. So he ha can only think that the other wants to abuse him or her because this is the way how he or she, she thinks. So it is a danger when somebody comes so close they feel helpless and it is a, it, it is they are absolutely attentive because they are going they are now going to do what they normally do they abuse me and they hide themselves um, they uh, cover dissimulate they don't uh, they always let open, uh, leave open a back door, a way out, or give answers who are not the, the whole truth. Who, where, when they say something which goes into the direction, but say only half of the thing. For instance, one patient uh, told me that he has great difficulties with uh, um, with his wife uh, because. He was in holidays in Mexico, and uh, and his wife, since he comes back, is really irritated and, and shouting to him. And I said, oh, why? I, I, I really don't understand. And he said, yeah, he, I also don't understand why. And, and I said, yeah, how long have you been there? Yeah, two weeks. And, and I asked, why didn't you go with her uh, on the holidays? And then slowly it turned out that he was with his girlfriend there. <laughs> but he didn't, he, we spoke uh, 20 minutes about the issue and I didn't understand. And so he is hiding himself, you know, this is the way. They, they do not say what they feel. If, if, they, uh, if they feel criticized or if they feel addressed, they, they do not refer to being addressed. They know it, but they hide themselves and say, why are you bothering me? You know, they give, give back something or in a, an aggressive way so that the other doesn't see that he understood or she understood quite well. Their motivation uh, is uh, the inner world of, his, of their motivation is that they always have agreed for advantages, for benefits. Uh, they have an intolerance of loss. They cannot bear not to gain from any situation or even to lose or to pay for something and not to get more than what they, they paid for. This can have extreme... Uh, uh, and even funny, uh, lead to funny situations when when somebody, uh, a narcissist, for instance, uh, is on ski holidays and have a ski pass uh, for the lifts, and there is snowing and, and mist, and so the narcissists go to this go to skiing because they pay for it and they cannot bear it to just do wellness the whole day while they have a, a, a paid ski pass. And they even do harm to themselves, but for getting something, for not losing. This is a pervasive uh, element in them. 
and the attention is focused only on, on themselves, that they are blind for the values and the world and for the other, this makes them so egoistic. The healthy person is open to, to oneself and to the other, but their motivation is only turning around their benefits, their uh, advantages, to, to bring through the own, the, the own intention, the own idea, the own uh, imagination, what is important for them, the own expectation. The dynamic, they have an inner dynamic, another element, a part of the motivation. The inner dynamic shows them, uh, appear, lets them appear with a defeating drive of freedom. They are, have a suppressing will. Everybody must do what they want. And they are suppressing and powerful in that. It, uh, the narcissist becomes unsupportable when people do not do what they, what they want. And he becomes respectless. He can even become aggressive and, or fight and is, makes reproaches. And, but it often starts differently. They come into a team and say, okay, he's inviting, we will do this together. And this sounds very nice. And everybody says, oh, good, yeah. He's so, he or she is so open and really wants to do it together. His mo this motto becomes visible and, and is felt only a bit later. He wants to do everything together but only that way how he or she thinks. This is this, uh, this um, uh, suppressing will, this drive of freedom. It, he, must, he wants to be so free that he, he feels squeezed in when he has to do something what other people want. It must always be what they want. Otherwise, it's unbearable for them. And they really, they can simply not support it. It's not a bad character. It's a, di it's a disorder. It's important that we know this, that this is, a, this is not something decided by this person. They cannot decide differently. They can learn over years in therapy, etc., to change it and to be more open. But there is a real deficit they are incapable to do it differently. And this makes it so difficult because we normally we think, well, uh, it, he, he or she is so egoistic and uh, she could do differently. But she cannot. They, in, in their dynamic, they remain, want to remain hidden. They live. Uh, they stay hidden, they give, have not much communication, they don't speak about themselves, they don't want that others enmesh in what, in, into their intentions or ideas. They want to do it alone, they do everything alone, because alone they are totally free. When, when they have to be respectful to somebody else, this is a loss of freedom, unbearable. The main thing is that he or she comes to, to gain, to get their goal. And they are, in this dynamic, uh, they are, of course, big rivals. They must do the things alone, because nobody can do it that well as they do. Everyone who would be a partner or in a team, they would, this would lead to a, a diminution of the outcome, of the success, because the other people have not, do not have that quality, that capacity as they have. And they are convinced about it. So narcissists are never uh, people for a team, only when the, peop the team is following what they want. Then, of course, they are 
good uh, bosses in a, of such a team. And of course, the result is only their, their own result. The contribution of the artist is always minimal compared to their achievement and what they do. And they are known in their dynamic uh, of their tenacity, uh, their impertinent uh, constancy. They, when they want something, they do not give up. They, this makes them very effective and strong. Even children with narcissistic traits, when they want an ice cream, they will get it, to be sure. And when they get it, think about it, that this is maybe a narcissistic trait. <laughs> when they are so impertinent and do not stop, so that uh, it, is on, it goes on the nerves. We, we cannot bear it anymore. And the adult is the same. And the they, this goes so far in their uh, tenacity that they can, it can lead to an insensible killing of other people, killing of their um, esteem, of their public esteem, or killing of uh, their self-value. They are uh, totally cold in this. Another element, I have one more, another element is that in the inner world they suffer or they experience an inner void. I said experience. They don't experience it because they have narcissistic solutions for this inner void. They escape the inner void. They have mainly, use mainly three uh, substitutions which cover the inner void. The first is when they feel in the void, they become envious. They develop envy. Envy is a symptom of a lack of self-value. And they do not have real self-value. And they do not admit themselves their lack of self-value. And they are the second form to avoid this inner emptiness is they are uh, dissatisfied, constantly dissatisfied. Some, some people tell it even directly in, in therapy after a certain time that they feel constant. They all, I, I have, for instance, a, cl a client or a patient was saying, I have a constantly the feeling of dissatisfaction within me and I don't know why. This man had everything, but was constantly dissatisfied. He has everything, but not himself. And this is a correct feeling. This feeling shows them that something important is lacking. And when they are not at home, they can easily feel, especially children, homesickness. Homesickness is a symptom of a lack of inner coziness. They are not at home in themselves. So they need the, the home which is known for them, which is safe for them, which is warm, which is cozy, which I is filled with their options. Then they have some feeling of, of being at home. And the reaction to this uh, inner void and emptiness with these symptoms of uh, envy, of dissatisfaction, and of homesickness, they develop reaction. And the main reaction is addiction. They are prone to addiction because they are dissatisfied. They have a, a, an underlying feeling of emptiness, of something lacking. And therefore, they need replacement. And Addiction is a good way to get, to, to, to get some feeling. Addiction of um, uh, uh, gambling, sex addiction is very common, and of course drugs, alcohol, designer drugs. And one 
uh, addiction is also very common in narcissists. They are workaholics. Because workaholics gives them the chance to be on the top. And everybody sees it. And they can compare themselves. And they are effective. And they are clever. And they, are, they have their competences. But this way how they work is a, a trial to overcome their inner emptiness. And the and f yeah. Finally, a few words on the relationship. Their relationships are coined by in the incapacity of loving. They cannot love. It may look like love. And they may buy the nicest uh, presents and be very helpful and functional. But it's not real love. Because for real love, you need to, we need to have access to our inner self. And this is empty. This, there is nothing. They are very poor. They would like to love, but they cannot. Love for them is to see themselves in their grandiosity, to experience their superiority with the other. Out of this and of this self-centeredness comes that the, attract the uh, attractiveness of the partner diminishes after a year or two. When they get married, it's typical that after two years, they don't feel the partner attractive anymore because the partner doesn't give that fresh feed which they need. This is very painful. They, they also suffer from this, but they find their, their solution. Other objects. They're in love. For instance, a narcissistic father said to her daughter, to his daughter, I love you because I live, I continue to live in you. As a, the, this daughter was, it was the daughter who was in therapy. She was destroyed because this was just one sentence of many similar sentences of this attitude which she experienced over years. This is so egoistic. He loves himself in the daughter. He abuses her. And he even tells her. And he devalues her. The sexuality is satisfying when they can experience that the partner comes to the climax by themselves, because they are so good. They want to experience themselves in the other. They, in general, they like to have a calm pole in their life. They, they are not the people who divorce so quickly. They keep their relationship. They own their relationship. They need it in a certain distance and continue their life apart. Well, what is the origin of this, uh, of this pathology? The, if we describe the origin from the outer side, from the experience with the world, what makes people so narcissistic or makes them develop narcissistic traits for the solution of their life? They experience inappropriate esteem or a lack of empathy. This is a general basis. They are not encountered. And they have, in general, 
they are not encountered by the essence of other people, by the person who really sees them and, and talks to them and empathizes. They have a lack of this. They have fun functional families, sometimes good and rich families and best, uh, uh, best citizens of a, of a city or of a town. They have all the materialistic uh, play tools, but not their parents, not their person. They are often in special roles. They are the preferred son or daughter. They have often special attitudes. Narcissus was extremely beautiful. Something similar is often the case in narcissistic personalities that they are very nice, beautiful, cute. Um, they are, uh, have special gifts, intellectual, verbal, uh, gifts in arts or sports, which makes them special. And they are, um, they are selected by their parents uh, to be their hope carrier who will realize what they couldn't realize. They couldn't become, couldn't study medicine, for instance, but their son or daughter has to do it now for them. It is also a kind of replacement. And it is also some abusive behavior. This makes people uh, very narcissistic. These special roles and these hope carriers, the special attributes, and they suffer or they experience the, that they sometimes are laughed at, put to ridicule, or that they are spoiled and pampered, and live in families in which the pain is um, is uh, not admitted, is excluded, is a taboo. There are painful family situations with um, infidelity of the parents and so on, and, and the suffering, and, but it is a taboo. Nobody may speak about it, but the children feel it. And this pain is neglected, is overrun, is overruled. This also contributes to this Non, not truthful, not, not uh, this lack of truth in the relationship, in the families. In, in the central is a, a, an experience of seduction. The narcissist experience a constant seduction, what they cannot stop, what they cannot resist, a seduction by the object by these representations of the ego which provide or which promise so much esteem that they are addicted to this seduction of the of the object seduction means that i am torn away from my way this is not what i really want when i'm seduced but i also want it but not really you have this bias in seduction. We lose the inner pole in seduction. And this is what happens constantly in the narcissist. The inner connection becomes atrophic. And they cannot let it be. They cannot uh, distance to this constant seduction because it's so attractive. Why is it so attractive? Because they want to be seen. To all is seducing them, which promises them to be seen in their value, which gives them value. They have such a big need because they are nothing without it. And therefore, they cannot resist. And the ego is not strong enough to develop a resistance. So, to sum it up, in the central of the development is the lack of real 
human encounter, of real personal dialogue, of empathizing that parents, the, 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 the environment, the people around them, really sees them, looks at them, takes them seriously, and talks with them. And this estrangement, this alienation by the seduction. They experience by the seduction that it, is, it turns around me, but not really. This turning around me is leading me away from my inner self. And there is a third element, there is a hereditary component, a biological component. There are people, there are families with, uh, where you can see that the narcissist trait go through several generations. This is also a basis for the development. So we come to the end with some reflection on how to deal with the narcissist personality and some few remarks on the therapy. Therapy is, of course, a bigger work, which is not the theme of, the, of this evening. But some few remarks, how can we deal with them and come to a good living together? It needs primarily an attitude in which we take seriously this personality. When we know that they need the admiration, we must give it to them. Not admiration, maybe, but the feeling of respect and the attitude of we let you be how you are. We don't, I don't want to change you. You are narcissistic and you must be narcissistic. I cannot be your, 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 your therapist. If we, do not, if we cannot accept that, we cannot be with them. But if we can accept them, we can live nicely together. They are, they are not bad persons. They, have, they are sick in something. And if, if I touch the wound, then of course they react heavily. Uh, strongly. But if we respect their wounds and do not touch them, but pro give them the feeling that for sure I will not touch your wound, then they are peaceful. They do not have to, to protect them. And they do not have to fight for them, for their construction of the ego. So this means when we do not want to change them, this is, of course, not always so easy as it is said here from me, because they are manipulative. They, we feel uh, forced. Uh, we, we, they force us to, for admi to give admiration. We already gave so much, and again and again. And, so, and the closer you are with this collaborator, friend, member of a family or partner. So the more difficult it can become. But some people are very well based in themselves and can say, well, I know you are so, but I love you. And I can love, we, we can love a narcissistic personality. This is possible. We do not get back the love. But we can see that this person behind. And when we are in that way respecting their disorder, their need, and give them a little bit of that seed, then they are peaceful. And we, we can live together quite nicely. Um, and this, of course, means also that they, um, we let them do the things by themselves. This is very important in therapy. The therapist should not try to do therapy with them. The therapist can only must go into the attitude of assistance. We, you will treat yourself by yourself, because the only one who can treat yourself is yourself. No other can compete with you. You are, you are the top. Nobody can understand you that well as you do. We can give you some ideas what you can do by speaking generally about, we can say, well, I don't know 
how I can uh, how I could help you because this is really special what you present. Uh, but in but in general, you know, in psychology, it, there is a description what people do or what one can do, and I don't know this uh, if this is helpful for you. But I, I'm just telling you. So by the way. And he is very attentive to this, what is said, by the way, when he is sure and ensured that I do not want to change him, I do not want to treat him, I am not superior, I am very humble, I know nothing corresponding <laughs> to you, but I know that some people spoke about this or gave, did it that way. And the next session or in a, in a couple of weeks, he comes back and says, and, and did exactly what was described. But he did it. He invented it by himself. He did it by himself. <laughs> and he doesn't know why he doesn't need a, a therapist at all. <laughs> because he is the best therapist. And despite of being there, he did it by himself. He, he had the idea. He forgot it. Or he cannot admit it. I don't even know if he forgot it. Maybe he had some memory, but he must be the best. And if I can live with that as a therapist, I can do good work with them. But it's difficult for a therapist to be nothing, to be engaged, to know that we have a heavy uh, disorder which needs all our strength and power. And at the end, we did nothing. And he did everything. This is a good treatment for therapists. <laughs> so in therapy, um, in therapy, we have special elements which we apply just to name them. We, um, we work with straight facts. We give straight explanations. Uh, very not personal, not, not saying that, that it's from me, but just information in, in, in a maximum uh, neutrality. We, start de we then start to confront themselves by asking them, what do you gain when you are so arrogant? What is the benefit which you have? Because if they always want to have a benefit, take them with their own need and connect it with an, another type or strain of behavior, this arrogancy. And then they slowly start to become a bit a more differentiated picture of themselves, a, se a self-image. We introduce the outer perspective. We, we, we uh, start after a while, after half a year or so, we start to speak about how this behavior is for other people, how other people react. They bring sometimes uh, conflicts which they have. And we take the conflict to understand why there is such a conflict. And so we again uh, connect or bring them, bring them into an encounter with themselves. Then. We need, of course, the deeper work because underneath there is this pain of not having been adequately seen and estimated and encountered and get the empathy. And this is very painful. They can even become suicidal when we come close to this central theme and pain. And then we also train them to see the value of conflicts. And that uh, in conflicts, they can find better themselves and start the inner dialogue. When they develop an inner dialogue, they are gone through, they are done. And in the, the, the central is that they live with the attitude, everything may be as it is. Because up to then, as long as they are narcissistic, everything must be as they want it to be. But when they are become so relaxed, when they get 
into contact with themselves and into a dialogue with themselves, then they can finally start or correct themselves because the impulse may remain, but they learn to correct themselves that everything may be as it is. This is also a good sentence to close the presentation, that everything is as it is, and it may be as it is, and then where we do not agree, we start to change it, to work on it. But we start, we, we begin with this attitude, everything may be as it is for the moment. And then we will see. Thank you for being so attentive. also a good perhaps sentence to end or to start some questions if things may be as they are or perhaps you have some questions about maybe they should be differently than they were presented here so a few questions here first of all one in the very back